Good afternoon and hello to everyone. Welcome to this uh, CF World Congress uh, virtual in Helsinki uh, session uh, entitled Dealing with Uncertainty. Uh, we are about to start uh, and finally we fortunately have our first speaker also together with us. So we are, um, we are complete and ready, uh, ready to start. Uh, my greatest welcome to uh, all of you. It's my pleasure to uh, meet uh, in this forum, all of you here. Um, I'm together uh, here at the university um, in Brno with my uh, co-conveners of this um, very uh, panel, uh, Dandrapala and uh, Martin Shimsha, so we at least made a short or small uh, small private uh, convener session in person. Uh, and it's a really pity that um, we are not able to meet in person. However, uh, probably there will be a chance in a, uh, in a future. So uh, to our session, we have today uh, five uh, wonderful papers and uh, many thanks to all uh, presenters uh, for their uh, submissions. I'm really uh, looking forward uh, much to them uh, because when we've been uh, thinking about uh, what um, should be uh, our panel about, uh, we were rather uh, uncertain uh, about what is really uh, uncertainty uh, should, would, or uh, or could be uh, within uh, ethnological or anthropologic, anthropological research. Uh, and probably uh, we will, at least in discussion, discussions came to some, um, some solution or um, we'll find what is uh, uncertainty uh, within, our, um, within our field. Before uh, we start, I would like just to remind you uh, to several points you probably already uh, all know. However, um, just to repeat, uh, the session will be uh, recorded. Um, so uh, please be uh, careful. Uh, everything is being recorded. However, uh, if, if you um, would like for, uh, for any reason, uh, you may have, um, uh, if you would uh, like not to be recorded, please uh, ask me and I will uh, directly ask our uh, technical support to um, stop uh, recording, uh, for instance, for your uh, presentation. Now, of course, uh, you may also ask me uh, for uh, removing uh, your presentations, questions from the recording uh, when it will be edited uh, after the um, after the panel and prior. Uh, this uh, this very panel will be. Uh, made accessible for uh, for public at the conference uh, web page. Uh, so uh, please keep this in mind. Um, uh, to our presentations, we have uh, today five uh, wonderful papers. Uh, and I uh, just kindly uh, ask our uh, presenters to be strict on time. Uh, we have 15 minutes for each presentations and then um, five minutes for uh, Q&A uh, short uh, section. Uh, if uh, you will be willing to stay with us um, after the uh, formal end of this, um, of this session, uh, we are allowed to uh, like have uh, 10, 15 uh, minutes more uh, after the, uh, after the, Officially scheduled uh, end of the uh, of the session. So uh, hopefully uh, there will be discussion, uh, some general discussion in the uh, in the very end. If you uh, will be uh, interested to uh, to have it. So anyway, uh, let's start. I have just passed uh, five minutes scheduled for uh, for the introduction, and I. Uh, first, uh, would like to uh, to ask uh, Elias Melando uh, 
uh, to shortly uh, introduce uh, himself and to share uh, his presentation uh, with us. So please, Elias, the, the floor is yours. Um, my name is Elias Melander. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. I'm an ethnologist. And today I'm going to talk about uh, prepping uh, under the header of not if, but when. And uh, this uh, presentation is a uh, um, result of my uh, two-year um, uh, postdoctoral project, which I'm in the middle of right now, where I study the emerging cultural phenomenon of prepping, uh, a phenomenon which has its roots in the US, but that has grown steadily in Sweden in the last 10 years, and also I know in other European countries. Uh, and it's uh, kind of manifest through a large number of blogs, several podcasts, uh, dedicated forums and social media, as well as online stores promoting specific prepping products. And for those not uh, familiar with, the, with this phenomenon, in short, you could say that prepping um, and those who prep are in different ways preparing themselves, their homes, their families, etc. for handling or surviving unforeseen situations ranging from accidents in everyday life to, for some at least, uh, total societal collapse. Uh, although it should be said that most resist the more apocalyptic narratives associated with medialized images of prepping. In short, prepping constitutes an orientation towards the future as a field of uncertainty and risk. And what I'm going to talk about today uh, is how this field is in different ways managed conceptually and what might get lost in the process by using two examples, that of a fictitious blackout scenario, uh, often used as a kind of a go-to crisis when preppers uh, talk amongst themselves of what they are preparing for. And uh, in contrast then, the ongoing and very real pandemic both which can be characterized as a SHTF scenario or shit hits the fan. That is a situation where things get serious. It is based on field work, uh, which mainly consists of serial interviews with tw 20 self-identifying preppers in Sweden um, who have, uh, besides um, having been interviewed, they have also documented the ways uh, they have prepared themselves through making lists and taking photos. And all the photos you see in this presentation are from the participants. Additionally, I've looked at stuff, um, material um, categories such as blogs, podcasts, and discussions in social media to kind of complement this material. So <clears throat> I've not made it my mission to decide what is or what isn't prepping, like the, the more subcultural question, so to speak. I'm instead let my participants make those kinds of distinctions. As others have pointed out, prepping can be considered a cultural repertoire consisting of a range of things, practices, skills, emotions, narratives, etc. Uh, but to make, make a bit uh, easier to grasp for those not familiar with the concept, most preps can be sorted into the following four categories. Uh, with the caveat that not all participants emphasize each category to the same extent. And the first and most obvious is the material preps. Uh, that is stockpiling things such as food, tools, materials for heat or light, medicine, weapons for hunting or defense perhaps, and as you can see here, currency or precious metals uh, for trade in case of uh, um, a larger societal breakdown. That is, things that can be useful in an emergency or when supply chains break down long term or short term. The second is the training of skills, such as growing vegetables, making fire, purifying water, or performing first aid. Uh, many of the participants stress the importance of training uh, and uh, with your materials. You can't just buy yourself security, you also need to know how to use things uh, in case of an emergency. The third is also a form of training, or rather conditioning of physical and mental capacities, such as training your strength or cardio, 
uh, but can also be exemplified when seeing a therapist to strengthen one's mental resilience. Or as I um, participant I talked with just the other day, they said that he takes cold showers in order to kind of wean himself off uh, the comforts of modern life. Uh, category four is to establish social networks, which can be question, a question of establishing contacts with people with specific strategic resources or skills, but it's often as simple as getting to know your neighbors. This is often emphasized by some what more experienced preppers, stressing that no man or woman is an island as it was. Additionally, a fifth category can be added, which frame these other resources which is plans for or imaginaries of the future. In many ways, the future can be said to be the central object to which, towards which preppers are oriented. And as the title of this paper indicates, the future is understood to be a field of risk. One needs to be prepared when and not if something happens. Thus, the only thing certain about the future is its uncertainty. At first glance, this is a quite a pessimistic disposition as it posits modern life as unstable and unsustainable, standing on the brink of breakdown or collapse. When things change, it will be for the worse. On the other hand, in accordance with sociologist Richard Mitchell's study of American survivalists, this pes pessimism can be said to go hand in hand with a delicate optimism. While the future is uncertain and out of our control, we can kind of hedge our chances in the here and now, for weathering the future storm by prepping, uh, establishing a sense of control in relation to the unpredictable and the arbitrary is therefore a central point uh, for establishing meaning through prepping. When facing towards the future and its uncertainties, uh, it is however easy to be kind of overwhelmed. If anything can happen, the need for preparations would be endless and any sense of control would be precarious. Because of this, the future can't be left open, but must be reduced to kind of manageable units. Here taking shape more or less articulated scenarios for which one can prepare. While rational thought and probability are used as framing devices for how such scenarios are drawn up, I would argue that there are other factors at play, influencing what future events are deemed prepping worthy. To exemplify this, I will use the grid down scenario, that is a large scale power outage or blackout. The single most common scenario presented by the participants when talking about what they are preparing for. Thus, an uncertainty deemed to be fairly certain. The law of electricity stands as a representation for the vulnerability that many preppers ascribe to modern digitalized society. If the uh, if we lose the electricity, the cost cascade effects will be far reaching, possibly setting us back to pre-modern living conditions. So why is this kind of used as a go-to scenario? First, I've, I would say that uh, one reason is that um, it is something that everyone or all the participants have experienced one time or another throughout their lives. Uh, its consequences are recognizable, at least on a small scale. Uh, and it's also been used in kind of these medialized and pop cultural representations of societal crisis. In Sweden, we have, for example, had this um, quite popular uh, reality show called Nedslekt Land or Blackout Country, where the participants got to live without electricity for a longer period of time. Secondly, I would say that the power outage is a consequence with many possible causes. This makes it a social scenario where preppers can discuss how to best handle the situation without getting into debates on the probability of the crisis scenario itself. The power outage is a problem that can be theoretically discussed together without getting into the politics of whether the biggest threat to society is terrorists or uh, climate change, for, it, for example. Thirdly, it is a crisis which can be scaled up to fit one's capacity for imagining uh, and one's economic means. It's just a question of getting some extra can. It may be just a question of getting some extra candles, uh, or you could buy an entire electrical generator. 
It could be a shorter period of huddling up with a family under a blanket, or it could be a period of widespread looting and chaos. Depending on how far one is willing to draw out the temporal, social and spatial dimensions, the scenario can accommodate many different kinds of prepping. And finally here, the scenario also brings with it a kind of invitation to adventure, at least in a small scale, as it allows for a test of skills and equipment one has acquired, kind of a Robinson Crusoe-esque uh, situation where one has to attend to the basic human needs without modern shortcuts. Um, it's that kind of part of prepping that made one of the participants kind of exclaim that, woohoo, now we get to cook, with a, a cook on the camping stove. Uh, when the lights went out in the area where he lived. In contrast then, the pandemic uh, is a situation which not a single participant, well, one, but almost all of them said that this was nothing they had uh, thought about, planned for or foreseen, which I thought was kind of curious since these are people that have spent uh, quite some time imagining different kinds of crises and catastrophes. Um, and also because it's, uh, it's a kind of scenario where both Swedish and international experts have warned about, which all of the participants have lived through. Uh, I mean, while SARS and the swine flu, for example, didn't hit Sweden particularly hard, at least it was something that happened during their lifetime. And which is also uh, depicted uh, quite frequently in popular culture, not at least in the zombie genre, which is kind of a, a steady point of reference among preppers. Uh, and it should also be said that while they hadn't foreseen the crisis, the participants were nevertheless quite well prepared in practice. When asked if their prepping had been any help, nearly all gave an answer like the one you can see on the screen. Well, that, well, they didn't have to panic by toilet paper, food or other supplies like the others uh, when the news of the pandemic broke. They had what they needed at home and didn't uh, have to expose themselves or others to contagion, claiming then a moral high ground versus all those who don't even have tomorrow's breakfast at home. With the pandemic also, there has been a shift in the societal status of prepping passing from kind of a fringe phenomena for weirdos to something more mainstream. At least that's what several of the participants can report. But why wasn't the pandemic then articulated as prepping worthy scenario, unlike the imagined blackout? One reason can of course be that the pandemic simply hasn't looked like expected, like the representations of disease in popular culture. As terrible and as testing as COVID-19 has been, uh, there's been little of the visual spectacle of Hollywood films, at least in Sweden, where there has been no strict lockdowns. In the same way, unlike the blackout, it's been a mostly unadventurous affair. Uh, where a good pair of, pair of sweatpants and a high-speed internet connection has been far more important than the ability to make fire in pouring rain. Uh, thus, it's kind of a less enticing form of crisis to fantasize about. Um, and speaking of internet connection, the digitalized infrastructure, which is what makes society vulnerable in conventional prepper narratives, have been a great asset during the pandemic, serving as a safety net for all those who have been able to work or socialize or consume from the safety of their own homes, maintaining some measure of normalcy while keeping distance. Thus the pandemic follows another script, so to speak, than the collective prepper imaginations, imaginations of a crisis, putting it in a blind spot. And finally, when asked how they could have prepared better for a pandemic, most participants answered that they would have bought more face masks or hand sanitizer. Beyond that, there were few suggestions for better preparedness. Uh, one interpretation is, of course, that there really wasn't much more that anyone could do to prepare. However, I would also argue that it, this illustrates how the imaginaries of the future are tied up in the material props or preps, as it were. In, contra in contrast, there is no shortage of material things which one can buy to prepare for the blackout. Blankets, candles, generators, etc. 
Without the artifacts or markets to manifest the future in the here and now, the pandemic becomes hard or perhaps irrelevant to imagine within the framework of prepper logic. So, in conclusion, prepping builds on a pessimistic outlook on the future where uncertainty is a given or a certain thing. At the same time, in order to become manageable, the future must be reduced to specific or, again, certain uncertainties in order for it not to become overwhelming. When it comes to how these risks are articulated, probability is an ob uh, in an objective sense is not necessarily the most important factor, but rather what risks are recognizable and, above all, actionable. Those uncertainties that cannot be planned for or handled are moved to the periphery as to not disturb the delicate balance between pessimism and optimistic drive that kind of characterizes prepping. Thank you. Wonderful. Many thanks for your uh, presentation, Elias, and uh, many thanks also for keeping on time. Uh, so now, uh, like more or less four minutes for, um, for your questions, I just like uh, ask you, Elias, to stop sharing your screen. Oh, of course. Uh, and uh, for discussion, please uh, do not use uh, chat, uh, neither in, in Zoom nor in Volva. Uh, please use that tool, raise your hand uh, in uh, Zoom, uh, and I will then ask you for, uh, for your questions. So please uh, raise your hands, whether you have uh, any question or comment or uh, or if you would like share your uh, knowledge on your own prepping or uh, whatever uh, you may. So please, Teresa. Yes, uh, thank you, Liz, for a wonderful presentation on, on preppers. So I'm a Danish American, so I know a little bit about the topic just being uh, growing up in America. I know that a lot of uh, my family friends had a very um, big culture of having an enormous supply of canned food, for example. And so I thought it was interesting just to reflect a bit on, I guess, the cultural differences and the, the kind of like the difference between the very intentional prepping and, and being identifying as a prepper. And then maybe more of the, for example, in the American culture, where it seems almost a little bit implicit and a way of life almost to be prepared for, for different situations, specifically with food. So I wanted to ask a little bit broadly how you thought about um, your topic in different cultural contexts and geographical contexts and, and what the differences were between um, kind of the Swedish model versus, or the Swedish context versus the American context. Mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, I will thank you for your question, of course. Um, but uh, first I would say that I think one of the reasons that, I mean, prepping has become uh, such a um, quite large subculture in Sweden um, is, of course, our distance from kind of crisis and catastrophe in everyday life. Uh, if you are living uh, like more with a closer to uh, natural catastrophes, etc., that's not prepping, that's just everyday life. Whereas, I mean, Sweden has been um, in peace for or depending on how you define it, but for at least 200 years. So, I mean, that is the kind of a, a good, um, how do you say, but a good foundation for like making this into a to subculture. Um, and then I would say, uh, furthermore, of course, there are specific differences, like there is less emphasis on guns in a Swedish context than in American, though they exist there, but they're not perhaps as front and center. Uh, and thirdly, I would also say that, um, oh no, I forgot what I was going to say, but, uh, well, you can see that there are, some who have adop uh, adopted a more, I would say, uh, traditionally individualistic stance in their prepping, that is, they want to be independent from systems, etc. Whereas others have uh, adopted what I would call more of a, a 
social democratic kind of model where it is well if i prepare society's resources can be used by those who need them more than i do etc so you have this kind of both collectivistic and more individualistic orientations within it um yeah so um yeah i said thank you for for this wonderful presentation and it's super interesting to see how uh, the pandemic hit the prepping uh, also as an uncertainty which they didn't plan to to face or didn't have plans uh, for that um, my question is following up on what uh, Teresa just said. Um, what I think is uh, interesting is um, that the, your interlocutors, they um, define themselves preppers, um, whereas there is also um, this discussion about prepping being on the borders to insanity. Uh, so, yeah, maybe you could elaborate a little more on that because there are those uh, prejudices about uh, preppers that they are crazy. Um, and I think it's interesting that there are, there are those people who define themselves prepper. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Uh, uh, this is one of the things that I cut out because I didn't have time. I would say that no, uh, all of them do not identify as preppers, actually. Uh, uh, when I asked, uh, f when I kind of search for participants, I look for people that prep, uh, not necessarily look at themselves as preppers. And this is a debate among many of them, if they should call themselves prepper or not, because they don't want to be associated with that kind of stereotypical image of uh, someone with a gun in a bunker, etc. Uh, but uh, it's also kind of... Um, um, the, the, the trouble of translating, which I haven't figured out yet, because we also had this Swedish word called beredskap, which would be translated into being prepared, basically. Uh, but they have very different connotations, where prepping is more American, perhaps 2000s, versus beredskap, which is more perhaps Second World War, Cold, uh, Cold War Sweden. Uh, and they have these different connotations and are used in, in, uh, to signal different things. Uh, so, uh, no, short answer, no, not everyone does identify specifically as preppers, but all identify as people who prep. Wonderful, thank you very much. And if you would have some more question or co questions or comments, please keep them for the final discussion. Uh, because now uh, it's time for uh, Chiara Tellarini. Uh, please, uh, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen right now. So, well, thank you very much, first of all. Uh, it's really great to be amongst all of you, and it's really a great presentation and great congress. So my name is Chiara and I recently graduated in the Master of Cultural Anthropology at University of Bologna with a thesis specific on environmental and medical anthropology. And my research was based in Australia, specifically among some Aboriginal communities, mainly situated in New South Wales and Victoria. And now I have been selected for a PhD position at Oldberg University in Copenhagen, where uh, I will be part of the GECO project, a European project where my main uh, duty will be to apply some experimental method like the theories of practice and experiential learning theory to the study of household energy, self-production and consumption all across mainly Europe, mainly in European countries. Uh, so the reason why I, 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 I mentioned these two aspects of my education, previous and upcoming education, since I'm going to start the PhD in August, is because I'm gonna mention both these aspects uh, in my presentation, which I decided to title The Power of Adaptation in Uncertain Times, Valuing Cultural Flexibility and Adaptation to Change. So I will look at uncertainty mainly in its ability to enable cultural context to be flexible and adaptable in uncertain times, in uncertain circumstances, and even in disrupting and dramatic times. So in the first part, I will read a brief extract from an interview I had with Uncle Graham, an Aboriginal elder from New South Wales, where he talks about the ability of uh, some Aboriginal cultures to incorporate some of the European and colonizers elements and how this helped them to actually culturally survive somehow through colonization. And in the second part, I will talk mostly about the 
theories of practice and experiential learning theory as applied instead to uh, some context in post-industrialized countries. So let's go with the first uh, part. Uh, I'm gonna read this extract and then make some comments on it. So, well, firstly here, as I said, Uncle Graham was talking about uh, the material incorporation of some of the elements that came from the European context. So he said, our cultures never stagnated. If we have the advantage, we'll take what we need to take to go forward. So some of the ideas that are okay, we'll take them and move on, collect and use that. And I'll give you another quick example. The National Park spends, you know, $15,000 doing this poisonous spray on this plant when we've adapted to use it in our health. So here he's talking about a plant that is not native to Australia. It was introduced by Europeans, but this National Park in New South Wales consider it as a weed, as an, uh, in, an invasive species to get rid of. So he's just saying that Aboriginal people adapted from time to the use of that plant to make some traditional medicine. You know, a part of the plant, we use it to mix it with other plants, native plants. So we save the government $30,000 to $50,000 when we go and collect it. We've negotiated so that we go and get it, so that they don't have to spend all that money spraying it and we can collect it. We've adapted to that introduced species, the same as the cat. Cat came into Australia and the fox, all part of our dreaming now, part of our stories. So we know how to hunt them. We know how to catch them. It's not a stagnated culture. We live and that's adapting. Let's face that in human intelligence, you can put something together and make it stronger again. You take it and you do it. It's part of our culture. It's not stagnated. We gather it and collect it and move, go forward to survive. So I found this extract pretty significant and very impactful because he talks about not just a mere um, incorporation of some material practices, like how to use certain types of plants or animals or species, he says something pretty impactful. He says, they are all part of our dreaming now. They are part of our stories. And the dreaming or dream time refers to the mythical stories about the creation, about the creation of all beings, of humans, of all natural elements and animals, according to Aboriginal history and mythology. So the dreaming is at the very base of all Aboriginal cultures and identities. So saying that something that came even from the colonizer side, side uh, became part of the dreaming, part of the stories they tell, it, it is pretty impactful. And I feel the need to say, because now I'm going to shift to Europe, so to a total, totally different context. And uh, of course, I'm not trying to compare this context. And I am aware that this incorporation of practices that Uncle Graham is talking about is still part of a colonization context, of a dramatic colonization context that included massacres, oppression, impoverishment, land seizure, and that still nowadays have detrimental effects on Aboriginal people's mental and um, physical health. So let's not forget that Australia is still a stolen land. But why? the reason why I chose to uh, include this extract in the first part of my presentation is because um, it, I found interesting how Uncle Graham underlined the fact that uh, some Aboriginal people, some Aboriginal communities, when they found, uh, like they incorporated external elements and the invaders elements, when they found that they could be actually fruitful for their own cultural survival. So this flexibility, this adaptability in his own person, in Uncle Graham's personal opinion, helped some of the Aboriginal cultures to actually maintain some of their aspects alive. And I just found it very, very interesting. Uh, in the second part, then, I'm going to talk about the theories of practice as applied to certain uh, contexts and also to our own daily lives, because one of the main characteristics that is specific to the theories of practice is that they focus on routines, so all on the routinized behaviors, on all those things, behaviors, ideas, values that we take for granted as part of our daily lives, we take for granted and we consider as certain. And because we consider them as certain, they could be harder to change to challenge and to question. And um, so this might be uh, especially dangerous when it comes to some toxic, let's say, behaviors that could be toxic for the environment and for the society, but that are taken for granted and that are considered certain in very uncertain times. So we have somehow some requirements coming from the ecological struggles we are facing that we should change some of our behaviors that are part of our daily lives. 
And uh, Evans writes that practices are often performed consistently and faithfully, but practitioners can adapt, improvise, and experiment. So practices can be, and with practices, we mean uh, these daily experiences. Uh, practices can be reinvented, can be recreated once practitioners uh, consciously uh, decide to change them. And uh, related to this, there is also the experiential learning theory, which could be considered as another uncertain experimental method as it is based on experience. And Cole defines it as the learning process where knowledge is created through the transformation of experience. And there is a specific example which really is very explicative of how this, um, is, this uh, experiential learning theory can be applied to uncertain contexts. It's the living lab approach, and it's been mentioned by Sarah Hakian and colleagues just in an article they written this year. And they talk about Energize as the first large-scale European effort to practically reduce household energy consumption through actual pra practical changes of experience. And uh, so they did this experiment all across Europe involving uh, different hundreds of households. And they aimed specifically at changing two practices. So firstly, they aimed to reduce the weekly washing cycles to, through washing machines. And secondly, they aimed to reduce the main household temperature to a maximum of 18 degrees. And they noticed that by changing and by triggering this change for the people that participated to the experiment uh, through the, by, by triggering this change, some of the people that participated to the experiment uh, they started to bring into conscious reflection some of uh, their daily practices that were even totally unrelated or just partially related to these two experiences they were asked to change. So some of the people uh, started to be more conscious about their water consumption, their food waste. And I think then this experiential learning theory as an uncertain research method can be very useful in challenging what we consider as certain, what we take for granted. And it can actually be very useful. And I will just conclude now. So as it is also stated in the, in the abstract to this, to this panel, uncertainty usually is a characteristic that cultures don't want to be identified with. Even just the prefix un usually implies itself some negativity. So we are used when we hear talking about someone who's been uncertain or unable, unbelievable. It is, we related to something negative, but what about talking, considering both certainty and uncertainty beyond their literal meaning? So what about even trying to challenge all the certainties we have? And what about in, in into this, re, uh, focusing also on those routine and on all those practices that we take for granted. And what about what, what, what happens when we consider them as uncertain? Is it a threat to our own cultural values or is it just a possibility, a chance we have to make them actually more flexi flexible, more adaptable in uh, the uncertain times that we are actually living? So I think, I don't know how much time do I have left, but I'm just gonna leave you with my bibliography. Um, that's all. Well, you still have like five more minutes at least. So ah, I was good. Okay. Like add something, you feel free to do so. Sorry, can you say that again? The last thing? Uh, well, if you if you would like to add something, you mm -hmm. still have enough time to, to do. So feel free to, uh, to add some more your presentation otherwise we can skip to questions and uh well it depends up, up to yeah you. there was actually one last thing i um which i actually forgot right now maybe it will come up during the questions but yeah i would close it here for now yeah so thank you thank you very much just please stop sharing perfect and uh, again, please raise your hands for your uh, questions or and comments to uh, to this uh, presentation. So, please. Okay, Teresa, please. <laughs> It's a little bit of a, um, a mundane question, but I was actually curious of what plant uh, in the first uh, couple slides that you were talking about specifically, the one the the one that was used for medicinal purposes. Oh, uh, I don't remember the name, 
I just remember it was like this introduced species, uh, not native in New South Wales, not native in Australia in general. Okay, all right. So any other question, comment or whatever? Michelle, please, your question. Yeah, no. Hi, Chiara. Actually, I wanted to ask if, um, I, if there are maybe it's a quite kind of general question, but uh, I wanted to know if there are maybe some situations in which there are there is some conflict between the the local traditional practices within the Aboriginal communities and the new environmental practices they have. I mean, come with the new sensitivity in, in the sustainability. And yeah, so that, that's uh, just a uh, general question that I wanted to, to have an answer about. Thanks. Uh, in my knowledge, yes, there are still some conflicts regarding this, even though uh, I believe that both environmental movements and the community in general, that, that's public community in general in Australia are becoming more aware and even more, yeah, more conscious about the Aboriginal practices of maintaining the environment. But if we think, for example, about the recent bushfires that hit Australia, especially the tremendous one that hit in between 2019 and 2020, even there, there have been some conflicts regarding the traditional burning practices that Aboriginal people have been used to do in, in their land for like more than 1000 years for sure. And uh, there have been conflicts between this and between some environmental movements that consider these bushfires as dangerous for the uh, endangered species of uh, wildlife. And uh, what Aboriginal people want in them to understand is that their bushfires are controlled in a way that they remain somehow low, so very close to the ground. They don't spread too much, so they're easily controllable. And even the smoke they produce, it is not too heavy. And actually the smoke could be a good indicator for the wildlife to run away from that area. So there, there are still some conflicts and Aboriginal people are not fully listened yet by the government and by public community, but I believe, I hope there is some more opening to these practices. Also, actually, um, still Uncle Graham talk, told me about an event that happened be, near his area. So they did uh, this cool burning practice. And because of this cool burning, they stopped a major bushfire that was coming from another side and they actually saved the village that was there. So at least this helped them to have to raise their voices in, in, into this. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. And again, last question or, uh, or comment, if you would have some. Well, if not, thank you very much, Yara, for your uh, presentation. It was uh, really a different view on uncertainty, but uh, well, pretty fruitful for um, for the session, to my opinion. Thank you again. Uh, and now we are slightly moving to uh, to labor, mobilities, and migrants. And I would like like to ask Flavia uh, to share her screen with us and uh, to uh, introduce us into her research. So the floor is yours, please. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. Uh, just let me know if you can also see the screen and everything is good. Okay, good. Again, then perfect. Can... Good, perfect. Um, today I would like my presentation, which has a slightly more modified title from the regional, um, I would like to uh, reflection that are based on the studies that I've conducted in the last years in collaboration with the Swiss National Center's competence and research on the move and lives, respectively on the work transition of company partners of mobile professionals and since in Switzerland. 
my interest in exploring uh, the experience of uncertainty for these very different migrants uh, aroused from the past. Can you hear me? Can you, can you hear me? Well, well, sorry to interrupt you, Flavia. Your connection seems to be... Uh, yeah, oh my God. Yeah. If I may ask you, just try to switch off your camera. It helps sometimes. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Let's try. Otherwise, I try to change connection uh, quickly uh, because um, I think it's a problem of this. Okay, let's try again now. I continue. I hope that you could catch something some uh, it's much better it's better okay yeah, it, it seems to be better now thanks That's thanks, thanks. much better Good. take it take um, it easy I, that's how how it works uh okay. with these these Good. hyper yeah. tools yeah sorry i was uh, i was expecting these problems otherwise i was my, Again, i was saying that easy. i i was saying that um, my interest in exploring the experience of uncertainty for these very different migrants arose from my past and current work on career trajectories in migration, uh, in particular on my recent studies on the interplay between imagination and mobility, my work on mobility and liminality, and my research, a research paper that I was writing on experience of waiting for refugees. Um, these specific conditions, processes, namely imagination, liminality, waiting, and immobilities in the concept of migration and career life, all shed light on this, this existential experience of uncertainty, but also on the potential change and transformation of force that can be associated with it, and which I would like to talk about today with you. I would like to start the talk with the words of Hiba, so down in... Um, Hiba, a woman of, uh, sorry, but, sorry, I just, yes, okay, much better, I can see now my own slide, uh, a woman of Syrian origins, uh, age 46, who moved to Switzerland almost five years ago. Even used to have a well-established and highly qualified profession before departure, a career that allowed her traveling often for business, including to Switzerland. In one of her visits to Switzerland in the past, she visited an asylum center for work-related reasons. Then when she came back later for seeking asylum, she ends up in the same center. And she tells me, uh, years ago, years ago, I visited the asylum center as an expert. Some years after, when I applied for asylum, I ended up in the same center. It was very complicated and emotional for me because my first visit was as an expert, then as a refugee. I experienced all these events as a, if it was a dream, as it wasn't real. Since the first day of the refugee center, the social worker told me, if you want, you can work. Even though I didn't know what the what job was, I said, yes, of course, because I want to continue working. I used to leave the house every morning to go to work and I used to work a lot. The next day, I found out that I actually have to work as a waitress in the dining room of the asylum center. For me, it was catastrophic. But I continued to work because I thought that there are only a few days and then I can work normally. The story of Hiba about the asylum center before and after portrays a transformation marked by the loss of control over her past and the indeterminateness of her present and future. The case of Hiba is an extreme case of status loss, of disruption of the reassuring coordinates of one's professional life. In such a disruption, a person can easily recognize herself as she was in the past. She can easily reconcile the present circumstances of her life with her aspiration for the future. In such certain uncertain circumstances, a human cannot do anything but wait for the right job to come, like respondents often indicate. Listening, listening to her words, I had to reflect about the multiple facets and temporalities of the condition of work uncertainty in the context of migration. Temporalities that include a constant confrontation within past and present and the waiting for the unknown and unpredictable future. Uncertainty, um, as, a, as a psychologist Ronald Begetto describes it, refers to a state of doubt, a lack of determinateness, sureness, stability, control, and predictability. It refers to a present state of a not knowing, a future oriented inability to confidently predict what would happen in the future and a potential lack of clarity of how to make sense of past events. But get to continue. Although experiencing uncertainty is often uncomfortable, that can sometimes result in negative outcomes. It can also be an animating force, which opens up new states of awareness and new possibility for thought and action. Uh, or actionable uncertainty, as he calls it. A start of doubts that 
it is to a level of awareness whereby we find ourselves an impasse and feel the need. It is in the space between the states of things that seem impossible and con to control and predict, and can even take a, a real course as described by Hiba, and the possibility to find a way out from the impasse and explore alternatives. I situate the experiences of uncertainty of migrants with professionals' qualification who, like Hiba, struggle to reconstruct their career. Both the partners of mobile professional and the Syrian refugees I met during my field work describe a specific rupture in the professional lives and everyday, and everyday work freedom on the occasion of the relocation to Switzerland. The qualifications are not always easily recognized or their legal status, especially in the case of refugees, represent a further constraint. These migrants experience a similar condition of a liminal hotspot, a condition of permanent certainty while transiting from the previous professional life to a worse situation that is not yet predictable. Liminality is a condition that is often too commonly associated with the migration of illegal migrants or refugees. It is undeniable that these migrants relate to very different mobility and immobility regimes. The asylum channel of migration to Switzerland has long been considered as being humanitarian and not skill based. Migrants in search of asylum in Switzerland do not see their education easily validated and can wait very long before getting an authorization to work. They often ascend, they are sent to a reception center once they arrive, where they have to wait for application of asylum to be processed. Once out of the, of the center, they are assigned to a canton, to a regional canton, entitled social assistance, but they are prohibited from working for at least three months following the submission of their application. They have to wait also for provisional archives from the past. Of the social, from the part of the social workers regarding the status of refugees and the kind of occupations in which refugees should be allowed to work. Switzerland rather seems to attract the, migration, the immigration of those categorized as highly skilled. Work-related international mobility represents a signifier of progress for many professional sectors. For couples, the rules in corporate environment, for example, or all international sectors, is often moving as a where both of us can even impact on the work life of the other, or at times need to quit the job and change plans for the family. In Switzerland, we have often been initially assisted by a family reunification through social work networks. These people can be confronted with a labor market that uh, in which jobs are scarce and employers, as they report, tend to favor locals rather than temporary migrants. Career then at times becomes a box to pack and maybe not to open once again in the next destination. The next step often comes without large notice as the working partner's assignment can require a sudden and unexpected new move. These regimes of repeated mobility, like the immigration control system for the asylum seekers, should be imagined as keeping people in an extended state of temporal displacement, to borrow Georgina Ramsey, Ramsey words, an experience that pulls a person out of illusionary comes of life with stability in a reality of a future that is not only uncertain, but which is determined by forces that are outside of their direct control. This experience does not only bring together the commonality of uncertainty for both migrants and non-migrants, but also like in the case of professional life on the move of very different migrant trajectories. The case of Tina illustrates this parallel is very well. She presents a very different mobile trajectory than Hiba. Like other partners of mobile professionals, she moves repeatedly to follow her partner international assignments in the field of research. Tina recently, and Tina and her family moved to Switzerland. She now looks for employment in her field of expertise and take care of her child at the same time. When she explains what happens, what appears more difficult in their mobile life, she expressed ambivalence and uncertainty toward her professional future, relating to the unpredictability of her husband's next destination of work. I wish we could stay a little longer, or perhaps in the next place where we're going, to stay there for a longer time, and I would have something more to myself. I miss work. Should I stay something? Should I study something more or study something different? What if I'm not going to, or if I won't be able to continue work? Is there something else? What would it be about my job search? And this is something that makes me feel a bit uncertain about this time here in Switzerland, because I wish I had some kind of goal even if I was studying or working. I wish I had something other than being at home. 
from being professional and full-time employee before departure with a certain puff, my respondents find themselves in a new temporal situation. Opposed to the previous routine as professional, going out every day to go to work and working a lot, as Ihiba says, this new situation is filled with too much time, with waiting. Migrants have been also confronted with social categories, such as refugees, or the housewife type, which offer this distorted reflection of their professional identities. Certainly, the time that these migrants have invested to achieve goals in their professional and personal life is disrupted. Displacement can reshape migrants' conception of career life, from being linear, cumulative, or simply stable, to being uncertain and fragmented. The predictable linear and chronological sequence and idea of progress often associated with career have gone lost. The experience of waiting and uncertainty regarding work, however, is not only a matter of disruption, it also serves to open up new ways of relating with the world around and make sense of oneself. Ways that might change the course of life and expectedly. The various temporal horizons marking waiting, the stable past professional lives, the unstable present work and uncertain future constantly shape each other. And the feedback into each other of the different temporalities transport the waiting and uncertainty into a space for imagination. What, I, what could I do instead, like Tina wonders? Or even a space for action oriented towards a, towards a possible future. Time is money, after all, for these people. And if they have time, they want to use it to do something or at least imagine alternatives. The wait for the right job or simply the authorization to work, like for us, I'm seekers, becomes an uncertain terrain where what is hoped for or may, may or not occur, with ambivalent effective resonance ranging from hope, enthusiasm, and urgency to apathy, par apathy paralysis, or liturgy. The calls and paralysis of these uncertainty circumstances, these migrants try no matter what and look for the solution. Some use their native languages to get access to the way or another, also temporarily or on a voluntary basis. A Syrian refugee told me that he started teaching Syrian cooking via YouTube's videos during the pandemic lockdown. Some respondents mentioned on formal ways of learning the local language, through Swiss friends, South educational methods, or, a use, or the use of alternative resources. Others engage in volunteering to find alternative local connection. The previous professional lives, interest, and new creative ideas continue to shape this migrant's expectation about career trajectory life projects. They can temporarily work in another sector or in a stable and unskilled jobs. But the final aspiration for these people is to reestablish, in one way or another, sooner or later, a professional life that does justice to their skills and interests. And it is this move to alter nurturing between past, present, and future, imagined future, that makes Yeah, so thank you for a, a wonderful uh, presentation as someone who is also... Uh, yeah, just graduated from a migration studies uh, master's. It's very fascinating to hear this this research. Um, I wanted to ask, I, and maybe I missed it because of the, the the poor connection. But what were some examples of the jobs that they that they were waiting to get, or or, or some of the jobs that they were hoping to get? Studies uh, were um, a very very diverse qualification. Can you can you still hear me? Because I still have this uh, message saying that internet is not stable, so <laughs> it's a little uncertain condition I am in, I am in right now. Um, but um, so in the case of a comp I would say they were all at least bachelor, and they were looking for a job in very different sectors, including education. Like they were teachers, they were. Um, there were uh, several den dentists, like medical, uh, <coughs> in, a, in, a, in the context of medic the dentist as a, as a medical um, sector. There were doctors. There were also lawyers, several lawyers, in, especially in the case of the refugees. Um, they were all qualified in a way or another. But they, uh, I, what I observed also, there was com kind of a, a common situation and circumstance they could <coughs> find themselves in Switzerland, especially. Um, with the difficulties to get uh, recognition of their qualification. So they were, this was already like one obstacle that very different. Uh, they are anyway confronted when they come here in Switzerland. Um, and then uh, what happened very often was, um, which uh, this is very specific in the case of the refugees because they have, the refugees have also uh, an expert obstacle that 
is also the stereotypes. Um, it was also the kind of um, jobs that were associated with, from especially from social workers. So they were normally invited to do um, to work in the, you know in, a, in a menial jobs like I don't know um, like jobs that were anyway um, not skilled at the level that they were actually hoping to work. Um, there was an easy association with uh, women for the, working in care and, uh, and then working construction, something like that. And they were like really complaining about and reporting these problems with the uh, confrontation with the stereotypes and gender stereotypes, I would, I would uh, define them. Um, yeah, but uh, sorry, I, I started responding to your question and then I started uh, another direction. Very interesting, all of it. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Flavia. Uh, and <coughs> you are pretty right uh, on time. So uh, I would ask, I would like to ask Teresa for <coughs> her presentation. The floor is yours. Perfect. Um, I'll share my screen here. Great. And you all can see it? Thumbs up. Perfect. Good. So uh, yeah, so uh, thank you to everyone and thank you uh, for having me here. I'm very excited. Um, and my uh, the paper that I'm going to present today, uh, a little bit similar to, to uh, Flavia's, but very different as well, also intersects um, the theme of mobility and, and labor. Um, so to dive right in, uh, today I will present my research paper, which served as my master's thesis in advanced migration studies at Copenhagen University. And it focuses on the phenomenon of trimmigrants, a colloquial term that mixes migrants and cannabis trimmers. My research more specifically is on young adults from Europe and California who migrate internally or internationally to mostly rural Northern California to do informal seasonal work of cannabis trimming. So the research paper and this presentation grapples with how these interlocutors navigated a very specific type of uncertainty constructed by the unique qualities of this type of labor. And then I will also go into, in the last part of the presentation, my um, theoretical framework that I use to try and analyze uh, this type of uncertainty. So uh, just to give a little brief uh, description of my participants, and I also wanted to say that these pictures are not my own. They are taken from um, the internet and various newspaper articles that I used in my literature review. Um, so going back, uh, my interlocutors were adults, were young adults and a mix of Californians and Europeans, mostly from Scandinavian countries and also different places in the UK. Um, all of them got the job through someone they knew. So word of mouth was definitely the method of getting this, this seasonal work. And the majority worked in the Emerald Triangle, which is the largest cannab cannabis produ producing region in California and most likely the world. But because a lot of these cannabis farms are operated in an unregulated um, you know, underground market. It's, it's very hard to find exact statistics on it. Uh, they were all fairly privileged in the sense that they uh, expressed that they did not do this job out of economic necessity. Uh, they had educations, other options and routes that they could have uh, chosen. So this wasn't a um, need-based uh, job, so to speak. Uh, however, they were also not wealthy and they were used to working temporary or odd jobs which required a form of mobility, such as being a ski instructor um, or doing a uh, wolfing, which is uh, when young people go to, for example, Australia to work on traditional agricultural farms, um, which is unpaid but free room and board, or being an au pair. So I found that most of the trimmers were attracted to this work because of the main characteristics of the labor itself. So for example, it was working with cannabis, which had a certain coolness factor because of its association to the attractive hippie values, but also because it was seen as a little bit transgressive. It was illegal and informal, so the foreigners could do the work without visas, and they all could earn fast money under the table. It was important, it was, in a, it was, in te it was temporary and in uh, beautiful non-touristic places, so the picture that I have down below is one of the, um, the environments that they, they were in. It really is uh, a very, very beautiful place with some of the largest redwood trees in the world, for example. Um, and the hope of a trimming job served as a motivation for mobility, an unknown adventure elsewhere. Lastly, the fact that it was all very uncertain and unpredictable helped construct their narratives around the adventurous trimmer grid experience. So one interlocutor says, cannabis trimming was quite a funny thing to end up doing. 
Like I didn't sit out to do it. I didn't plan to do it, but the sh- the chance sort of came to me. And I thought I'm the sort of person that always kind of likes to try new stuff. However, at the same time, the characteristics that make the work attractive were also what shaped it to be very challenging and, um, and where the, the interlocutors faced uh, a great deal of hardships and uncertainties. So for example, the remote locations of the cannabis farms and the socio-historical context in which they are placed in uh, constructed a particular kind of risk and uncertainty that I really tried to, to outline and deconstruct in my paper. Uh, one trimmer comments by saying, you're literally in the middle of nowhere. A mountain lion can, can come up on you. You can run into a boar or something, or you can walk into someone's yard and not even know it. And they would always say, watch out. There's no warning shots up here. So someone would shoot your ass if you're in the wrong part of the forest. You'll definitely get shot at. So the culture in the Emerald Triangle, um, which is also heavily linked to cannabis's connotations, of course, is roughly stated a mix of 1960s, 70s hippie values uh, and criminal tendencies. Uh, Though there was a discourse of a laid back work culture, such as being able to get high on the job, the local cannabis community also worked under an intense paranoia due to past negative interactions with law enforcement and stories of theft, which I can go a little bit more into perhaps um, later. And some of the some of my interlocutors had really uh, expected and hoped for more of the hippie values and less of the the criminal tendencies, but quickly found that these two things were were inseparable. So several of the trimmers were offered to carry guns, and they br- were briefed on what to do if there was an FBI raid or if cannabis thieves helicoptered in on their property. Types of uncertainty and unpredictability that the Europeans, in particular, were not very excited about dealing with. One woman from Scandinavia says the farm was in the middle of nowhere. So it was a bit like, are we going to be executed? And then we got there and we didn't know how long of a time we would be there. So there certainly are real risks and dangers to being a trimigrant in this region. From dangerous wild predators, trespassing and getting shot, and not knowing where you are and when you would be able to leave. And though though talking about execution um, may seem a bit extreme, and it probably is uh, over-exaggerated in this this quote, when I was about to do, when I was going to do my intended uh, ethnographic field work, which then got, um, you know, pushed aside due to COVID-19, like so many others, um, I was also extremely aware about my own safety uh, going to Humboldt as as a woman by myself, as, um, as Humboldt, a county in the Emerald Triangle, has the highest per capita missing persons rate in the, in the state. And uh, there are countless tragic stories of human trafficking, rape, and the sexual abuse of women. Luckily, none of my participants experienced any of these things firsthand. Um, however, they nonetheless had to manage living in this uncertain field. Furthermore, the labor itself was in its own way, lacking basic security um, and predictability, as their living and working conditions were often poor, and there were sudden, sudden firings, and a couple of them were cheated out of their wage <clears throat> at the end. So as this phenomenon has never been studied in depth from, uh, in depth from an academic p- perspective before, there were only um, a lot of media pieces, blogs, uh, even a Netflix documentary series called Murder Mountain. Um, I had to really uh, tailor my own uh, research, and, and, and it was difficult because I didn't really have because of the lack of prior existing literature on the topic, I didn't really have a clear theoretical roadmap that I could kind of lean on. So I found it really challenging to find the appropriate theories and the concepts to analyze how they navigated the underlying uncertainty in their journey, their work and their meaning making, which was how I very much structured my analysis. However, I was inspired by Colleen de Haas, um, Haas's urge to not use typical dichotomous assessments of um, of physical movement and also people's experiences. Uh, Some relevant to my case are, for example, illegal versus legal, tourist versus vagabond, which is uh, Bauman's turn, and uh, marginalized versus empowered. And instead, try to embrace the fluidity and nuances in the research topic. In this attempt, I was confronted with the fact that I had to take seriously my participants' privileges and resources without ignoring their differences and experiences of hardship in this labor. For example, my interlocutors did not fit into the category of illegal migrants, as some were American citizens and and the Europeans easily obtained visas and could without much friction enter the country legally. 
In other words, their bodies were not marked as illegal, but it was the work that they chose to do that was. This is, of course, very different from, for example, people without legal status who are often left with no other choice but to take up precarious, irregular work. My participants' experiences were also very different from woofers, which I mentioned earlier, which, again, briefly described as young people who also travel internationally to do a form of volunteer work on agricultural farms and get free room and board. Um, as cannabis and its illegality just heavily shaped the, the work experience and the work culture there. Grappling with these differences and uncertainties and posing the question, why do relatively young people travel to a remote mountain in California to work long hours under precarious labor conditions guided my choice of theory. I chose to work with the interplay between precarity, agency, and mobility. And the participants' similar life stages is relevant in understanding their motivations and ways of navigating uncertainty. Andy Furlong and Fred Cartmel reminds us that young adults today face new risks and opportunities in their journey into adulthood. And in youth studies, mobility is, is often liter literally and figuratively linked to the temporary stage of young adults, young adulthood, a journey of what is described by, for example, Valentina Cosacrera as a pinball metaphor to represent young adults' uncertain, fragmented, and individual paths. So diving into the theoretical framework itself, the term precarity was useful in my exploration of young adults in new and risky environments, as it conjures up the image of teetering on the edge, that an uncertain situation might go either way. I relied on Etlinger's, Nancy Etlinger's definition of precarity, as the opposite of certainty, security, and predictability to explore, and I quote, the different processes that give rise to precarious labor conditions for different groups of people in variable space-time contexts. Though the work itself aligned with Standing's formulations of labor precarity, the narratives in the interviews did not reflect a class struggle or the new precarious dangerous class that Standing describes. In, the, in this theoretically reflexive process, I kept investigating what type of precarity was at play here and how their navigation of precarity is different depending on who steps into the precarious field and what resources they have to actually mobilize. I found that in precarity literature and research that there's a tendency to focus on acts of resistance as the main way of tracing agency. Though this is extremely important, a resistance framework was not fitting for my case as it more so expressed a form of chosen temporary precarity, where the young adults had the privileges to play with uncertainty and precarity in this temporary situation. And the marginality they faced under the labor was, all, was not a permanent condition. Though precarity helped me analyze what gave rise to uncertainty and unpredictability in this particular labor field, I didn't find it to be the perfect term, to be honest, and really struggled with what term I could use and what concept I could use to analyze the different ways um, that uncertainty uh, popped up in this experience. And I found the case raised interesting questions about the concept and its potential boundaries and limitations. For example, is it a precarious labor experience if it is chosen and temporary? What sort of assumptions do, does precarity carry? And why, do we use, why don't we use other similar words such as risk and uncertainty? Lastly, how do we as researchers differentiate between people's uncertain conditions? As I said, when I was comparing to other cases, um, you know, it, it was different and how I had a really hard time trying to uh, delimit that because I found that to be very important when engaging with the topic of uncertainty. So to analyze their acts of agency in a different way than the resistance perspective in uh, precarity literature, I looked to Pierre Bourdieu and, um, and very much adapted his concepts. So in the paper, I traced how they mobilized the resources, their resources throughout the journey, such as the Europeans having high mobility capital, being able to again easily enter the country. Um, however, once they worked and lived on the farms themselves, they had very few resources and less overall agency. And to outline the new and specific skills, knowledge, and attitudes that the interlocutors gained when navigating this new context, I reformulated what is, what is known as subcultural capital to conceptualize the tailored concept of trim capital. Um, this tailored term was helpful in understanding how the workers cope with the unique working norms and culture influences by, influenced by cannabis's duality as a hippie plant on one side 
and a criminal drug on the other. In the paper, I also related trim capital to Bourdieu's notion of symbolic capital, namely that the lived experience of being a cannabis trimmer has a certain symbolic weight or value as something extraordinary, rare, and cool, which is heavily shaped by cannabis's connotations. Through this framework, I found that trimmers engaged in a specific type of labor precarity due to their desire to gain a form of symbolic capital they could not have gained elsewhere. I asked the participants during the interview if they would have endured similar conditions and labor precarity had they been picking tomatoes, and they all agreed they would have not. So in terms of analyzing their mobility, I've chosen to focus on the intimate relationship between hope and uncertainty, which Flavia was actually a little bit into as well in her presentation um, for these final minutes, which I will quickly look how much, three, great. And, um, and, and this, this uh, framework and this relationship really helped me to better understand you know, what motivated these young people to go and do this. So if something is certain, secure, and predictable, then there's not the opportunity for unknown positive outcomes. Francis Collins argues that hope, the hopes of young people makes them move, and that this is often tied to narratives of transformation and becoming. Hope pushes them into the unknown, the uncertain. The desire and hope to explore the unknown entices the young interlocutors to go elsewhere, where there's both the possibility of favorable and unfavorable outcomes. And in this case, that is a remote cannabis community in the mountains of California. Through a form of meaning making, the participants were able to turn their experienced labor precarity, which had marginalizing tendencies, into an endearing story that relates to their own subjective understandings of themselves. We can see this when Anthony, a young American who did not end up making the money he had hoped after spending six months on the mountain, he said, I think anyone that has the work ethic to do something that you've never done before and to be able to roll with the punches and stick with it and be able to do it, to come, out the end, to come out the other end with some kind of profit or some kind of positive look on it, I think you've grown as a person. You've conquered something you've never tried before, and that solidifies in your mind. And even if you fail, the fact that you've had the balls to go and do it, some people will live their life not knowing what if they did something and that's not me. I don't ever want to say, oh, I didn't do, do this. So I'm very happy that I did it. <clears throat> Here I argue that the interlocutors vest their trimmigrant experience with meaning as a way of dealing with uncertainty and negotiating the hardships that they face in the labor. Relating back to the concept of precarity and agency, their narratives provide an example of how labor precarity is not always resisted, as in this specific case, the characteristics that make the work precarious are also what gives it its attractive symbolic value in which they hope to gain. So to wrap up, um, I will just briefly relate my findings and conclusions. Um, so being the first of its kind, uh, the research is able to contribute to an under-researched topic within specifically uh, cannabis research on one of the largest cannabis producing regions in the world, which there's very little literature on. Um, and one of my main arguments is that the research nuances the argument in precarity literature, that its analytical potential lies primarily in its ability to uncover acts of resistance. Instead, the paper finds different expressions of agency. The young cannab cannabis workers do not resist, um, resist it, but rather choose to navigate the temporary precarity involved in the trigger grid experience, as it provides a form of symbolic value that they could not have gained elsewhere. Secondly, I found that illegal temporary cannabis work in California can be both marginalizing and empowering, and that the experience is significantly shaped by who steps into the social field and what resources they have and can acquire. Thank you so much. Here's a very long list of resources. <laughs> well, impressive. So uh, many thanks for your uh, presentation and again, keeping on time. Uh, and it's time for your questions and comments towards Teresa. So please raise your hands. Elias, please. Yes, thank you for a lovely presentation. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, how did you kind of gain access to the field? Uh, how did you enter it and what, what were the, as a researcher, what were the kind of hurdles you had to navigate? 
Yes. So thank you for this question, because this was actually a part of my presentation and then I did not uh, end up really having the time to cover it. So so my the research journey itself was also very much relevant in regards to the panel's theme of dealing with uncertainty. Um, so to, to answer the question first, um, I, I kind of felt that I bridged a kind of insider outsider um, position on this topic because I was born and raised in San Francisco, California but to two Danish parents and have lived the past nine years in Copenhagen, Denmark. And so I had, um, my friends had summer houses actually in this region because it's known as a really beautiful place. So as a child, I would actually go to this area and visit. So I had, I knew a bit about it, but I actually, um, before the Netflix documentary series came out about Murder Mountain, I actually hadn't understood the kind of, or grasped the, the, the scale and size of this phenomenon that actually uh, thousands of, of migrants migrate to this, this area each year to do this um, informal seasonal work. And so I had planned uh, through one of my um, family friends who had a summer house in the area and uh, a new people that lived there year round. I was able to touch base with some key actors in the community and had set up a very uh, wonderful, in my opinion, uh, planned ethnographic research with various cannabis farms and also their trimmers. And then due to COVID-19, it all fell apart. So I had to re-strategize. And um, at one point, it actually was looking like it was going to be impossible for me to do the research because all of this is, you know, informal and ha happening under the radar. So there wasn't, you know, any online forums. There wasn't any job posts. So I actually kind of miraculously, in my opinion, managed to, to recruit uh, the, the seven interview participants I ended up interviewing through my own network. And so one of a, a big part of my method section in my paper was then also, you know, thoroughly going through how my own positionality has obviously really impacted the, the sample size of these trimmers, that they're young people. They come from Europe and from California, where I do as well, um, because there it's also maybe important to, to note that uh, the trimmers are a, are a very heterogeneous group of people. And, you know, there are um, you know, Mexican Americans, Indigenous Native American communities that do it, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so my sample size, I was really, um, you know, kind of specific. But it is my my understanding that they are they do make up the kind of majority of seasonal workers still. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And another question will be from Flavia. So please. Yes, hoping that you can hear me. I've changed connections. <laughs> they works better. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. I really found it fascinating, uh, the topic of your research, because I think it's a very nice example of how uh, migration and mobility categories that can become blurred. And so, yeah, well, even I had the feeling that we were talking about, it's also about tourism in a way yeah. or another. Yeah. And um so I have just a, a small question out of curiosity and then maybe like some reflection of theoretical side, which I would find very interesting for you, maybe too, if you haven't done it before. But um, first, I would like to know, there were uh, there are sort of young people between 1925, so sort of what we call the young adulthood. Uh, I was wondering if they study, if they're students, if they work like before this, uh, this uh, travel, uh, what do they do normally, these people? Um, this is a curiosity I had. And, and then I was, uh, I was a little reflecting about the thing that you were talking about, that this sort of journey to adulthood, like this is an experience, like they choose a temporary precarity as a form of uncertainty that can, you know, the unknown that give you a sort of experience, they, they, they experience. Uh, so I, I was uh, thinking a lot about the the, the, the concept of liminality as um, developed by Bjorn Thomasen when he talks about the limi void. You know, the, uh, it, it, does, it does give this example, the extreme example of bumpy jumping, like uh, near death experience as a sort of you know transformation of the human experience. What people, what, you know, pass through this sort of um, liminal uh, place where they can become anything. I don't know if it might be interesting for you to look at that as well, because um, that seems very interesting to, to link precarity, which is normally seen as a, a negative experience, uh, linked to labor, linked to the kind of migrants I was talking before. 
uh, I think it's a, it's a bit, it will be a very fascinating uh, sort of you know direction you can take with your uh, your topic of research. Yeah, perfect. Like, stop. Sorry, I was talking too much. <laughs> no, no worries. Was it Bjorn Thompson? Was that the name you said? Bjorn Thomason. Thomason. Okay, great. I yeah, can write to that you sounds then. very interesting. And yeah, there, it was interesting to see how many, um, like you said, like with the bungee jumping, how many metaphors there are, like how intimately linked um, youth studies and mobility studies are in some way. And and that was very interesting. But uh, to, to address your um, question, your first question about what they actually do. Um, so without sounding too uh, stereotypical, they certainly did align with, you know, the kind of... Um, uh, youth hippie uh, people that that uh, that you would kind of stereotypically expect. A lot of them, which I thought was interesting, uh, specifically the European. Sorry, the European. Um, they were uh, kind of identified as with this kind of backpacker um, uh, identity in the sense that, uh, for example, the quote that I read aloud of of the one participant who kind of stumbled upon it. She was actually going to travel six months in uh, South America, met a British guy who was supposed to be trimming cannabis in California. They got romantically involved and then it kind of, you know, she got the opportunities through there. So I th what I thought was really interesting was that uh, none of the participants actively pursued this form of labor and saying, oh, this is really what I want to do. The chance kind of fell into their laps. And that's why I think it's very, very linked to their, their own identity and their own understanding of themselves as someone that you know, says yes to an opportunity and doesn't want to regret it and things like that. But um, but a lot of them, they had a, they had different levels of education. Um, half of them had at least a uh, bachelor's degree. However, interesting enough, only one or two were actually planning on using it. Um, so to to give a little bit of a radical example, one of my participants when I was doing the the remote interview, he was currently trying to set up a. Um, a sort of uh, festival in Spain in a remote location off the grid where they built their own ecosystems and where this, the goal was to be 100% sustainable and things like that. And interestingly, a lot he, the, well, during his uh, time on the cannabis farms, he didn't only trim the cannabis, he also worked setting up the actual grow houses. So he actually learned a lot of skills that he was actually able to take with him in this new um, endeavor. So generally speaking, they all had different uh, education. Some were cooks, some were, um, uh, you know, uh, had a physical therapy degree and so, so on and so forth. Um, but we're very much in this process of being in youth transition in the sense of that it was very uncertain what path they were actually going to take and, uh, and what they wanted to do with their lives, so to speak. And to ask, uh, anyone who had presented uh, today. So do not hesitate to ask Teresa, Elias, Chiara and Flavia uh, for anything you would be interested in her uh, presentations going from preppers uh, to cannabis growing uh, Yes, yeah. Uh, I was curious to understand if there, are, if you've seen any difference in terms of gender. Like, uh, I don't know if you have a, there is a tendency of prepping more or <laughs> in a different way among women or. Um, well, the, first off, uh, the the. the, the Male female division in, in in the group I have is basically two thirds men one third women around there. Um, when it comes to the prepping itself, um, not really. I mean, there are some differences in framing uh, when talking about the different things. I mean, there is one that this classic example of. Uh, Mm, preppers often have all these kind of different bags. You have the bug out bag that you have when you have, need to relocate, and you have an everyday carry bag where you have stuff that you need every day. Uh, and as one of the female participants said, like, well, I have a purse, 
that's what women's had like for hundreds of years and we don't call that the everyday carry bag but i mean that's what it is and who also kind of challenged this idea of prepping saying that uh, well this is most of it isn't it like basically um what do you say house like how householding or uh, resource management like um so i think within prepping uh, exists uh, this kind of interesting gendering dynamic of of uh, kind of framing um, well if, if at least if we we kind of accept that prepping as a concept have kind of a male connotation but a lot of the actual practices that goes into it are more uh, what what uh, um, like you know, the stay-at-home wife would have done 50 years ago or that anyone would have done 150 years ago. Um, so I can't say that there's definite difference between men and women, but, but there are things there to be explored and that I am currently thinking about. Thank you. Teresa, please. Yeah, kind of a follow-up comment on that, because I was actually thinking that very similar to you as Flavia about how, you know, women have kind of informally done this, just not called it this for, for a very long time, obviously. And then uh, to, to jump into a, a, another intersectional identity, what about in, in regards to class? Was there, um, I, maybe you didn't measure for it specifically, but was there any tendencies in the data of whether it was um, people are from lower class or middle class or, or more on the wealthy end of the spectrum? I would say that all the participants uh, have been, uh, I, would, I would call them middle class, basically. These are people who have the extra resources needed uh, to do this because even if um, it doesn't have to be something, I mean, getting a basic prep kit together it doesn't necessarily be a super uh, expensive thing but it also takes space i mean uh, it's not something that you perhaps can do easily in a small apartment for example so i would say these are people that are relatively well off but they're not like super rich or anything uh, finally uh, Flavia, please uh, hi, yes, it's still a question for Elias. I might have missed it during your uh, presentation, but when did you start exactly this, this research um, for prepping? Well, that's, that's a funny story because I got the research grant uh, before Christmas 2019 and the start date for the uh, project was July last year. So in that half a year in between uh, the conditions changed radically um, so I'm, I'm i'm one year into the project now officially but of course i've started a little little before that yeah i wanted to ask this because i didn't understand if you started this research as part like of a study of, of prepping during covid or it just came on the way yeah. no nope, that was just uh, <laughs> in in this specific case it was a happy accident but yeah okay unfortunately Inker is still not with us uh, so we can follow the discussion or continue in our discussion Elias please Yes. Uh, first of all, I, I just want to make like a general comment that I think it's it's really interesting that um, how we all looked at cultural like phenomena where uncertainty is either something as as uh, I think Shiara uh, pointed out that it can be kind of a resource or uh, something that uh, really appreciated the. Um, what is it in your conclusion that the un kind of gives it negative connotations where it has some potential in a way um, or as in in uh, teresa's case of like kind of looking for uncertainty uh, in a sense i just wanted to ask uh, i have a question for teresa about um 
I don't really know how to phrase this, but what you talked about these people kind of uh, um, looking for at least like living with uncertainty. Um, is there, um, would you say that there's a, perhaps a bit um, nihilistic perhaps um, disposition in that? I mean, if we want to uh, go full out and say like, okay, my my future is so uncertain anyway i will i will i won't be able to get a full time job or anything so i might as well go and 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 cut ganya on the on the murder mountain was there any any could you see anything of that in the material so this was again one of those um one of my kind of struggles in 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 choosing grounding it in some sort of theory because i had also looked at um uh, in, instead of precarious, I had also looked at, at the kind of risk taking as a as a concept in itself. Um, however, it also just again became the the data was so nuanced and complicated in some way that it didn't really fit that uh, model either. And that was also because um, one I found, and I didn't have time for this in the presentation, but the there was actually quite big differences between the Europeans and the Californians. Um, kind of imaginations of what this uncertainty could actually be, both the favorable and the unfavorable outcomes. So I think the Californians had a little bit um, of, a, to use Bojir, a cultural capital in the sense that they were born and raised in California and they, you know, they kind of knew, one of the participants said, I remember, um, I knew I was not going up to meet doctors and lawyers. I mean, they had a sense of that there were going to be some criminal tendencies um, however, the Europeans, I think, were the ones in particular that were really chasing this kind of symbolic uh, capital that that was very associated to, you know, it being in California, it being cannabis and so on and so forth, um, where where they were, I think, a bit more taken aback about how um, one physically demanding it was to actually sit in a chair for 12 hours, uh, weeks or months on end doing this work. Um, but then also these these uncertainties of uh, helicopters and so on and so forth. I don't, I mean, ag again, I think this speaks to more an interesting theoretical discussion on the, on, you know, as researchers, uh, can we, how can we determine what is kind of objective versus subjective risk in some way? And because that's obviously very much determined by uh, the participants themselves, but but we also need to analyze what, what they say. So, so what I had, most of the literature on this topic engaged with how uh, dangerous it was for women specifically and how trimmers was also a very gendered job. Um, there were a lot of job posts where it was like trim topless and you will earn more money or things like that. Um, and so I, in my interviews, I kind of asked these questions of trying to ask, you know, the women, did you feel a little bit more unsafe or how aware were you of the, the risks that you were kind of going into? And surprisingly, a lot of them um, stated that they didn't feel particularly unsafe, that they didn't feel discriminated against based on gender or race or anything like that. Uh, but then my interviews were around two hours long. And then at the end of the interviews, then it would come up kind of the actually really did suck not knowing when I could leave this, you know, goddamn cannabis farm and all of these things of the frustration start. Uh, sorry, Teresa, to interrupt you. Yes, uh, yes, Inkeri is together yes, with yes. us again. Uh, and we still have uh, a little bit of time because uh, the next uh, issue we probably... Uh, will join is the General Assembly of, of, of CF, which is also very important, uh, especially for us here in the Czech Republic. Uh, but anyway, uh, in Kerry, uh, if your connection will somehow uh, help you, uh, could you please, or if you would like to give us at least a short summary of your <laughs> Uh, of your presentation, so please feel free to do that. And my topic was more about uncertainty in the research process. Um, um, I'm now trying to think what are the crucial parts of what I wanted to say. Um, I'm doing an article-based based dissertation on museum practices 
in Finland and like recent museum history. And I'm using um, an interview material that was gathered before my own research project began. So I'm my uh, project is rather material based um, and restricted to this interview material that is archived. And um, it uh, sort of expressed um, purposes of this project, like this National uh, Finnish Museum History project, project where these interviews were gathered, uh, was to sort of document the change in museum profession in Finland. And um, I have, um, like what I find interesting is that there is like a rather uh, striking lack of uh, discussion about the, the new museum lecturers profession that developed in, uh, since the 1970s in Finland. And um, I would like to discuss this in an article, but I'm kind of wondering like what grounds do I have to to like focus a whole article on something that is not there in the empir empirical material because usually the ethnological research is so grounded in the um, empirical material and, and fieldwork and such. Um, so um, I'm wondering if I'm kind of speculating or jumping to conclusions if I want to talk about something like that. But I also think that it would be rather valuable because there is um, other lit literature about the museum pedagogy and how it has developed, how this new profession has developed. Um, but this literature probably would not mention what my material is hinting at, which is that this new profession was maybe not regarded as like really proper museum work in the same way as curators work was and other like more object oriented uh, or people who did academic research in the museums. And that there is perhaps this tension why, um, or that there is like a hierarchy and a reason why this topic was not discussed and why also museum lecturers were not really interviewed as part of this project. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm a bit thrown here. Um, I guess my, my, my point was that there is always this, this um, uncertain element, this, uh, this flash of, um, I don't know, flash of brilliance or epiphany where you form your hypothesis and it is always rather dependent on your you as a researcher and your previous knowledge and your um, sort of your persona, maybe. And it is not always so easy to clarify or justify to others. And I'm wondering what is the balance between this, this uh, uncertainty and, and creativity and then like what we consider certain knowledge, what is the balance of those in, in research? Okay. This is maybe in short. M many thanks for your uh, short, uh, but uh, to my opinion, very, uh, very important presentation. Uh, and again, don't worry about these technical issues. Uh, we will, as conveners, uh, get uh, to all of you in a short, like within two or three weeks, depending on our other uh, duties, uh, with some maybe questions or, uh, or suggestions how to put this panel um, together, maybe in a, in a special issue of, of some journal or whatever. Uh, because as far as I see, uh, despite uh, despite the very topics of uh, the presentations were uh, quite far from each other, uh, on the other side, uh, they fit uh, quite well together uh, and they communicate somehow with, uh, with each other uh, from preppers to uh, uncertainty uh, in, in museum research and uh, well, uh, it will be worth uh, to uh, to uh, have them somehow get uh, get published. Uh, so uh, this is 
uh, the end of our uh, session today. Uh, thank all of you for uh, coming here for your questions. And of course, uh, many thanks uh, to Inkeri, Teresa, uh, Chiara, Flavia, and Elias for uh, their wonderful presentations. Stay, stay safe, stay well, if possible, in these uncertain times, unfortunately still. Uh, best regards to all of you, also from my uh, colleagues here, from Daniel, from Martin. Good luck and maybe see you in two years uh, here, uh, here in Brno at the next CF Congress. Thank you and bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.